This is my hammer, baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, would you like me to see it? <laughs> would you like me to use it on you? Yeah, yeah. Wait, no, that sounds... Wait, good. that's... Mm. Uh, Anyways, hammer uh, as in penis. Yes. I'm talking oh, about. Oh, oh. The it's, hammer. It's more clear now. Not, I'm not trying clear. to hit anyone with a hammer. No, you don't want to kill him. No. Yeah. Well, maybe. Jeez, am I but drunk? No, uh, not yet. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Johnny Christ. This is Drinks with Johnny. And today I'm joined by Shane Told, the lead singer of the band Silverstein. He's got a great podcast called Lean C Lead Singer Syndrome, if I could say it. Maybe he could say it a little bit <laughs> better for me. I'm um, really excited to have him here. He's been in the band for 22 years now, podcasting for seven. And uh, we're going to have an absolute great time getting to know one another here in a minute. So uh, without further ado, here's Shane Told. How are you, man? What's up? Thank you for having me, man. This Thanks is what a here. setup. What a house. This is beautiful, <laughs> man. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's still early in the day, but I just feel like I need a drink. I think we're going so to have to get I am, I'm ready, man. So while, I, while I'm getting this beer poured for you, yeah. um, or maybe I'll just hand it to you, you can go ahead and pour. Why don't you tell me a little bit about, you know, your beginnings and, uh, you know, just a quick overview of, of who you are and what you do, man. Yeah, man. I mean, I think, you know, early on in my life, around age 12, um, you know, I have an older sister. She's uh, seven years older than me. And she was always with her door closed, you know, listening to like cool music. And she'd dance in her room. And I wasn't allowed to go in there, right? So I was like, man, it's so cool. What's this music? So every time she would sneak, you know, she would leave, I'd sneak into her room and listen to her records and her CDs and stuff. And uh, that's when it started, man. And for me, it was like, the Metallica Black album. Yeah. That that record spoke to me in a weird way. It was like I'd heard it before. It was like almost like deja vu in a way. And I was like, I have to play guitar. I just have to. And that's so where it started with guitar started. for you. Yeah, I'm a guitar player. Okay. I don't even consider myself a lead singer, honestly. That's I know hilarious. I am. That's but, hilarious when you have a have a podcast yeah. called the lead yeah. singer syndrome as well. Well, that's the amazing thing about the podcast is like I would say 90% of the people don't consider themselves lead singers. Right. They're drummers that, you know, guitar players, bass players, they're the only people in the room that could carry a tune. So, that they, so it's they like, you do job. it. I, I, and that's I my story, you know? That's pretty much how it goes a lot of times, especially in the garage bands and stuff. So, so here you go. This is the Drinks with Johnny Filthy IPA. Thank you. It's made here in Huntington Beach. Mm. And I think it's pretty fucking good. You tell I me. I like it. Let me put the glass, the, the oh, branded look at glass this towards this the camera. Place, man. He knows what here he's we doing. Go. Yeah. Cheers, Cheers man. Johnny. Thank you. Oh, it's good. You like that? Yeah, what's the ABV on this one? It's a 7.6. Yeah, it's not too boozy, though. Not too boozy. It doesn't, it, yeah. it drinks a lot better than a, than a lot mm -hmm. of 7.6s. It's because it's just up below a double IPA. Once you get into 8 yeah. plus, you're kind of in the double IPA realm. Um, so it's, it just pushes the line just a little bit, just like I like to all the time. No, it's so, delicious. So West Coast style. West Coast you know, style. I know a lot IPA. of it's going towards the like hazy. You know, mm -hmm. the New England IPA. I, I still really like the style when it's done right. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's the funny to say the everyday drinker of IPAs to me is the West Coast IPA. That's, yeah. that's what I wanted. You know, I got yeah. it right here in my house. Might as well make it an everyday drinker and have a good time with it. But let's, let's talk a little it. bit more about, uh, about yourself, a little bit more about being a guitar player, not a singer, and podcaster, yeah. not a singer. And uh, we'll just take it right over here to the chairs. Let's go. Cheers. Cool. So now we got you here. I guess gotta have to break the ice here right now, like, mm -hmm. and talk about how you just showed up about an hour and fifteen minutes early. You were the most on time or ahead of time guest I've ever had. I apologize I couldn't offer you to come in right away. <laughs> I had just gotten back from a meeting. I was stuffing my face with some food. I just got a new tripod for this. No, I was it's all good. upstairs with it, and I heard someone's voice outside my gate, and I was like. I know that voice now. I've been listening to that voice for the last week in preparation <laughs> for this. And I looked over the fence and there you were. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you Johnny, I am late for literally everything. You <laughs> caught me on like, I guess a really good day or something, but then I ended up being too early. So it, yeah, it's a total mess, but no, you know, logistically sometimes, you know, the number two, the number three, they just look the same in an email, I guess. Right. So whatever. <laughs> it's all good. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you're here. You guys are out here for the House of Blues shows. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how how was uh, last night loading in, and how was uh, how's everything going with the tour right now? Yeah, man, it's awesome. You know, we're out with uh, Bear Teeth, who are our best friends in the world, uh, and also Devil Wears Prada and Era. So it's a pretty stacked bill, um, and it's just cool because we're all friends. You right. know, we all already know each other. There's no like awkward like first day meeting everybody. Like it was like we're just all partying on the first day. Perfect. And it's 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 really really a, a great vibe, and. People are excited. They come out in droves. Two two nights at House of Blues is is, is great. All the crew guys are excited because they don't have to load out. Load yeah, in they, got, they got a, they got a roadie Friday. Exactly. Yeah, it's like it's like a, we call it a half day. Half day. There yeah. You go. So yeah, it's 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 really great. So man, yeah, couldn't couldn't be happier. You know, um, beautiful day outside. It's 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 incredible. And uh, you brought some you know, good weather from Canada out here. It's not usually what happens either. <laughs> the cloud follows me, dude, wherever I go. But but no, like honestly, man, you know, with with having so much time away from the road and everything being so up in the air, I think it's a little it tastes a little sweeter. Yeah. You know, um, this is more bitter this beer. <laughs> but it's uh, no, it's definitely sweet to to be back and, and rocking again and and like especially this. There's no, we don't have no COVID pro- protocol, yes, no yeah. mask. We're just like. Oh, that's great. So that's that's the good yeah. thing to wait out for because I know like a lot of bands were itching to get back out and a lot of my friends and different bands and I wanted to go out and see their concerts and I was like, you know, and when they come through and I'm like, hey man, am I going to get to see you? And they're like, hell no, we got a bubble going on. I'm like, I'm not going to that show. I'm waiting until I can see you and hang out with you. You know, I've seen enough concerts. I'm yeah. not going for that. I'm going for the hang. And um, yeah, to that point, so this is, did you do any tours prior to this? Where you did have a COVID protocol that you guys yeah. had to do? Yeah, we did. So back, go back to twenty March 2020, and uh, we were in the middle of our 20th anniversary tour, biggest tour we've ever done. Yeah. About 10 shows in when, you know, Rudy Gobert, Utah Jazz player, got it. <laughs> Tom Hanks got it. And, when and Tom we Hanks were, got it, though, that was when everyone was like, was like oh, this is real now. Yes. Now Tom Hanks has got it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, we had to, you know, stop right there. And, you know, that's March 2020. And then we mm-hmm. resumed the tour. We kept, we didn't know. It was like, oh, all we have to do is stay inside for like two weeks and it'll just be gone, right? right. That's what we, that's the, the mentality. So we, we, uh, we put, we put, um, you know, we, we kept the shows like postponed, you know, oh, reschedule, reschedule until we finally got to, to finish the tour dates last, last fall. Oh wow! Right, so it was pretty crazy. Did you still call it the twentieth anniversary, though. We just kind of like erased the ad mat <laughs> and like spray painted twenty twenty one over it. Uh, but uh, you know, it was um, it was definitely great to to finish that. But it was at the same time like so much fear. Like couldn't see, like you said, bubble. Couldn't see any friends. Wearing masks all the time. Everyone just constantly like, is, oh, is, is that a sniffle? We have COVID, yeah. are we gonna have to shut this thing down? And that's to your point though on the fear part, it's more at that point to my understanding, I haven't been out there to do that yet, but it, oh, yeah. it, it's the business side of it. You know, if someone's sick, mm-hmm. you gotta shut down a lot. You gotta shut down the entire show. You gotta sh- shut down this stuff. And it's not like, that makes the, the touring very hard to afford, even just to oh. break even. If, oh, you yeah. got a day, if you gotta take days off, right? Dude, especially with, um just even before having to shut down that tour in 2020. Okay, and that's like, yeah. you know, that's our money for the year, honestly. Right. A tour like that. So it's, it's kind of wild. And, um, but, but being able to resume it and get through it without any COVID, except when we got home, all five of us got COVID in the last, we all had it in the last three months. So it's kind of like, okay, well. in the last three months though. In yeah. The, in the entire world, everyone got the last, the last yep. train. Exactly. But now it's like, okay, well, if we've all got it in the last three months, we're probably good for this tour. And I think that that's, you know, kind of maybe the, how it's, the mentality shifted a little bit. Right. But it feels damn good, man. I'll bet. I, mean, I can't good. wait to get back out there. But So the reception really good last night here in, in Orange County? They're treating you well? Always good. You know, this, this is like our second home. And I know that's a cliche thing to say, but it's really true. You know, going back to our second album, Discovering the Waterfront, you know, we recorded it with Cameron Webb in Santa Ana. We lived in Costa Mesa, uh, right by South Coast Plaza. Where was, oh, I know all the, yeah, what, what's, yeah. what's the name of that studio? Uh, Maple. Maple, I haven't been in that one. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's in like a, almost like a, it looks like a storage, like area. Yeah, like a warehouse, bunch yeah. of warehouses. But it's a pretty storage. legit yeah. studio. It's got like an API, you know, in there and everything. It's, you got some great gear. And, you know, this is going back to 2005. 
But you know, living how long here, were you in Costa Mesa. You said you were in Costa Mesa. Costa how Mesa. Long were you there? We lived there for like you know six or seven weeks when we did the record. Okay. And um, yeah, man, like South Coast Plaza, right at what is it, Sunflower, or Bristol? I don't know. Yep. I forget the exact cross streets, but there's a few different ones. It's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. Depends on which entrance you want to go to. Right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And so you know that was the first time we'd ever stayed anywhere for a long period of time outside of our home. So right away, it's like, you know, it's February and it's beautiful out. And we're like, man, this is just incredible. And then, of course, you know, um, Chain Reaction, the first oh, yeah. time we ever sold at a show was Chain Reaction. So we always feel like the Orange County is like the people have just really made our career and, and really gave us our start. So yeah. we always feel like we'll come back, we'll, you know, we'll always give back. We did a free show at Chain Reaction a few years ago. You know, just to just to try to give back a little bit. Oh, that's and, awesome! Uh, yeah, man. So I I just love love it here. Yeah, the, the, it's funny you bring up train, chain reaction. It's where I saw most of my first shows ever. Yeah. You know, outside of big concerts, that's where you'd go as a kid and catch all the punk rock bands, all the local hardcore bands. I know. And it's such it's like our CBGB of of totally. Orange County. Totally. And and that's the thing, man. Is like growing up with uh, in Canada, you hear about it even though it's so far really? away. I oh, yeah. I, so, you know, being able to play there, it was like, oh, my God. And, of course, you walk in, and you're like, it's not that great. No, it's <laughs> terrible. It's, it's, it's really terrible. hot. I mean, that's, like, like, well, that's the whole point. The <laughs> stage is tiny. Yep. <laughs> you can't fit everything on there. I mean, but, but you got the little outdoor area. That's, it's in a shopping mart. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah, it's a like plaza. In a, it's yeah. in a plaza, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not what you'd expect. It's off in the corner. <laughs> yeah. No, it was the same as like other legendary venues. You know, I, I, you know, like in Chicago, the Fireside Bowl. Okay. We yeah. played there. That was our first ever American show. Wow. So we, How long ago was that? 2003. Okay. So we, we signed a victory, a uh, Chicago-based record label. And so it made sense to be, okay, our first show is in Chicago. At the, and I heard, you know, you hear about all the, the old Chicago bands, Naked Ray Gun or Bull Weevils or 80 Fingers Louie or... or I'll call it trio, you know, mm -hmm. playing this venue, and then you go there, and it's like, oh, fireside bowl. Oh, it's a, literally a bowling alley. I didn't yeah. even know that. You know, <laughs> it's like it's like cool, you know, when you when you start to to you know see this stuff in in real life. So, yeah, man, it's. Uh, no, and where in Canada did you guys uh, did you guys start out then? So we're from the Toronto area. Okay. So we we claim Burlington, Ontario, Canada. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but it's kind of like it's like that weird thing. Like if you're from, I don't know. Riverside, can you claim LA? Like, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like just far away enough. Like, a lot of people do, though. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So we, we didn't want to claim Toronto. We didn't want to claim like downtown because we're not really from there. Right. But, you know, I grew up going to shows and seeing every band in Toronto. And that's like, I live downtown Toronto. Uh, Billy and Paul Mark still live in downtown Toronto. So that's, that's our home. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, love, I love Toronto every time I go there. It's a great city. Yeah, man, it's great. I, I mean, you know, it's always you're always like I feel like your own worst critic, mm -hmm. just in anything you do. And since I'm, From that's there, my place. Like, I'm yeah, always yeah. like, I wish there were some better venues. And well, like, that's you know. why I don't claim LA because like it's for that same reason. I'm Huntington Beach. I'm Orange County. LA yeah. is a different thing. I don't, yep. I don't claim that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of um, that was kind of our thing. But. Everyone in LA, just like all of our LA fans, just like fuck you. I'm just being honest. Hey, I don't like LA. Hey, I mean, I know that's but that's the thing. I always I like the that. Lakers. Okay. Well, you don't have an Orange County basketball Even team. Even if we did, I'd still be purple and gold, man. Hey, cheers yeah, to Well, you were talking about sports a second ago with, with, with uh, Rudy Gobert. Are yeah. You, you, and I, yeah. I heard you talking before you're a uh, Dallas Cowboys fan. Where do you, where do you stand on uh, basketball? Um, basketball Toronto Raptors. Okay. I'm that makes sense. You got it. You got, okay. Massive Raptors fan. And um, it's, you, go to, you, know, you get to get a lot of games? I, I go to as many as I can. Um, see, I'm, I'm not a Fairweather fan. Like, I know they just won a championship, and a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But I was there in 1995 when they played in the Sky Dome where the Blue Jays play, 50,000 mm -hmm. cap stadium. Yeah. They put the little basketball court. I went to games there, <laughs> you know. So I've, I've been, you know, I've been a fan a long time. I've been there through the, like, well, awful, realize, awful years. So, like, they, it's a fi I've been in that stadium before. Yeah. I didn't realize they just scaled it down for basketball. Did they scale down the seating or well, did they? They didn't really. It, they only did this for maybe a year, or maybe two years, if memory serves. Um, but yeah, they, they basically would sell whatever ticket 
Wow. I mean, if you're stupid enough to buy one in the, the way up there, upper it's for bowl, a basketball court, it's it's kind of like you bring up the Cowboys. I think they had the NBA All Star Game in Dallas, and they put like a hundred thousand people at the AT and T Stadium. It's like who's gonna like? You're well, just they watching have that the big screen. Ass screen. They didn't yeah. have that big ass screen. Exactly, but but no, I love I love the Raptors. Um, they're making a little run this year, man. They're like yeah. they're in. I think they're fifth now in the East. That's great. A lot of people counted them out and said there's no way they were going to make the playoffs. Well, but, I'm on the other side of that coin as a yeah. Lakers fan. We're supposed to go to the <sighs> championship and not even going to make the playoffs now. So It's funny because we were just in Utah, <laughs> and we went to the Jazz-Lakers game. How, I, and I, I, I haven't been able to watch enough this, this season. because The Lakers lost. Yep, sure. But, I, went, um, I went to my first game of the season a few nights ago in L.A. It yeah. was just great to be out, but like honestly, I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Disappointing season for LeBron and uh, Davis. And it's okay though; they already got one championship together. They're still under contract for another year. We'll see see what happens. But we get back to football. Yeah, as you can see from my hat, I'm a Raiders fan. Yeah, you're a um, Cowboys fan, and I think we ruined your uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, 100. <laughs> percent I was supposed to be at that game. I had tickets. Did you to to go to the game? But because of COVID, Ooh. made the decision. It was maybe not a good idea to go to a football, but you know, now I, now I look back, I'm like, damn it. She's gone, but But, yeah. um, no, well, originally, um, I, and I still am a Bills fan. Okay. Growing up very close to Buffalo. Right. Only, you know, an hour maybe. Uh, my childhood going to those games, freezing my ass, sitting on this bench, like, I can never do shivering. that. Shivering. Oh, I know that I'm a bitch, because I would dude, never do that. It's not worth it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I don't have good memories of this, wow. you know? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the games. I don't remember the scores. I just remember being freezing cold and watching like grown men fight each other. Like, and what's funny is growing up as a kid, you saw the Bills all the time. The AFC Championship four oh, yeah. times in a row. Yep. Couldn't get over the bit over the uh, 49ers or the Cowboys at the time. Yep. And then, but no one really realizes, and I didn't even realize it. It's not a knock on people for their geographical errors. I didn't realize until I started touring how close Buffalo was to Canada. When you go yep. right over Niagara, I mean, that's part of New York, Buffalo, New York. It's yep. right above it is Niagara Falls. And then right above, up beyond that is Canada. So it's like, it's all, and I didn't realize that growing up, but you don't realize just how north it is. Because everyone thinks of New York, we think about Manhattan. Yeah. We don't think about the, the upstate stuff. Yep. No, no, exactly. So yeah, the Bills were, yeah, watching them lose four Super Bowls in a row in my childhood was um, both exciting and traumatizing. <laughs> um, and I mean, they, they kept were getting so, back. <laughs> yeah, and then they were so bad for, for a lot of years. Um, I didn't watch as much football, you know, I think. Part of it was because of that. Then I started dating a girl who, be, who was just a massive Cowboys fan. It was like, you, it's, it's season, like every Sunday, we're not doing anything. We're watching, we're watching the Cowboys. And I was like, the Cowboys? But man, that team, it's, it's a soap opera. Yeah, well, that it is, is like true. it is every they make week. headlines. They make headlines for stuff off off of the uh, field more than they do for stuff on the field. I mean, yeah, and that's starting <laughs> to change. But I don't know. I kind of just started to develop a sweet spot. Like I think Dak Prescott is a really compelling uh, player, both on and off the field. I really like him. The Ezekiel Elliott drama is always interesting. Um, and then you know, even this like, Micah Parsons last year. Being this Dude, just what a, force. What a machine. What a yeah. machine he was. So, I, I, yeah, I, I, am a, I am a Cowboys fan now. I'll always so, we have a soft spot for the Bills. I don't know if I'm allowed to have two teams if they're in different, different conferences. I'll let it slide. You're from okay. Canada. Okay. Yeah, it's right. Like, if we had a Toronto team, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it would be different. <laughs> but I don't think it's ever going to happen. I know, it's okay. No, I mean, as I'm saying it, too, I'm talking, about, I'm talking shit on the Cowboys. There you go. They, they, they have off-field discretions. I'm a Raiders fan. I know a lot more about off-field off, off discretions. I won't. <laughs> moving, to, moving to Vegas isn't helping anything. My oh, sister, I love it. I love my sister it. lives in Vegas. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, like, awesome that they got a team now. And, and I, I love the night, Golden Knights and, like, everything they've done. That, that, like, I've always said, man, Vegas, like, why not? I guess it's, like, people were scared about the gambling. And now it's, like, they're going to have all four teams in the next five years, I think. Absolutely. And, and to that point about gambling, they, you're right. They were waiting around for that. And now that it's open to the, to the league, basically, yeah. why not? And especially, and they, they knew which, which one of the teams they were going to pick. Who else are you going to pick? One of the biggest out-of-market franchises, the Dallas Cowboys being the probably biggest out-of-market out of franchise. Yeah. And they aren't going anywhere. They're not leaving Dallas. So who's, who's next up? The Oakland Raiders. They didn't like their stadium for yeah. how many years? They were playing on a baseball diamond for how many years? Yeah. 
and they have the second biggest uh, out of franchise market. So they are going to be able to bring fans in from everywhere. Yeah, and I haven't I haven't That's read the cents. you know the the behind the scenes sports you know what's going on with baseball, but doesn't it make sense that the Oakland A's will move to Vegas too? I don't. I yeah, mean, I mean, they're I know there's different too. things, know. but their payroll's so low. You know, there's still a team that wins. Yeah. But imagine that in, in Las Vegas, how good it, how it, would do, it would do amazing. I agree. I mean, yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, I just, they need their own field, though, because you got to leave yeah. Allegiant Stadium to the, to the Raiders now. They finally have their own stadium. <laughs> leave it alone. Yeah. And, and I mean, they're going to need a covered stadium in Las Vegas, I, I yeah. believe, too. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it retracts. It's a oh, no, I mean for baseball. Oh, for baseball. Yeah. Oh, for sure they will. Yeah. yeah. But uh, going back to the lead singer syndrome real quick. Sure. You mentioned that, like, 90% of the singers on your show don't consider themselves singers, but you've had like guys like Miles Kennedy, uh, yeah. Jonathan Davis, Fat Mike. Yeah. I mean, some, and then everyone in between, your, your boy uh, from Beartooth was like your first Yeah, episode. Caleb, yeah. Caleb, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it is pretty wild, you know, I mean, like we were saying, you know, I'm a guitar player first and kind of just fell into the singing role and never had the personality of, and I won't name names, you, you know who I'm talking about, the real lead singer syndrome. Okay, Vince Neil, you know, that, that kind of, that kind of a, a personality, right? The, the, the really real cliche. So the name lead singer syndrome, obviously very tongue in cheek. Um, but yeah, most guys, it's like, yeah, they, they were just, you know, in their bedroom playing guitar and they just couldn't find somebody that was dedicated to singing or could sing. And over time, they everyone sucks when they start. By the way, of singing. Course, yeah. And over time, you get better. And you know, for someone like me, I now I guess you know I don't even play, like, I don't even have a guitar on this tour. I'm not mm -hmm. playing guitar at all. I'm just singing this, which is easier. Yeah. You know, but but no, I think someone like Fat Mike, he's known more as I'd say a songwriter than he is a singer. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Davis probably more of a front man. Um, but yeah, no, no, like um, I forget who else you said, but. It's, it's incredible how many people have that story. It's yeah. really, really amazing. It's, I mean, it makes sense, too, because, I mean, that's, that's how I've come to know a lot of singers, too, is that they all have started as, with some other instrument, gradually yeah. got to that point. I mean, famously, Ozzy Osbourne was the kid in the neighborhood who had a PA system, so you're the lead singer. Oh, yeah. Like, so it's like, I mean, that's, that's going way back, and it's still <laughs> happening, you know? Uh, the yeah. other one I mentioned, though, was Miles Kennedy. And I, oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that chat because uh, there was some really good insight on, on ego on that one that, that you guys got into and dropping that, which is interesting when you're talking about a podcast, again, tongue in cheek, being called the lead singer syndrome. Well, Miles Kennedy is such an interesting personality because you're the front man of like Slash, yeah. but you're not the front man when it's Slash. The band is Slash. Yes. Every, all eyes are on Slash. And you're singing, so you know, so yeah, you kind of do have to check your ego at the door if you're in a project like that. And Ultra Bridge is sort of the same thing, you know. Mark Tremonti mm -hmm. being uh, such a, I mean, he was he won best guitar player of like the the decade or something, you know, in guitar world or whatever whatever it is. So I think a guy like that to be able to kind of go in and navigate his own ego versus the others and still be a front man uh, is. Is pretty is pretty special and, and a little almost ins inspirational, right? Because he's such a good guy, such a talented singer, and a great songwriter and guitar player too. Yeah, guy gets no credit for, for being a very solid guitar player. Yeah, so yeah, I think when you're when people aren't showcasing it as much, it's easy to forget about that and just think of them as in you know in the way that they are. And to me, I like that you're doing this podcast because uh, much like this one, it's kind of controlling the narrative of of certain things. It's like opening it up, okay. You could go read the magazines and they're going to write how they're going to write it. They're going to edit it how they're going to edit exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. But when you're in control of your own narrative this way, you're kind of, and you're talking, you know, tongue in cheek, again, about this, this syndrome that everyone attaches to big egos. Yeah. Um, you're kind of controlling that narrative for you and a lot of other front men, right? No, 100%, man. I think the whole podcast format, you know, and having it be long form, and I don't, heavily edit anything you know what i mean um 
I'll take if someone says something and they want me to take it out, I will. I'll yeah, give them that's, that. That's, you know that's, what that's I kind mean? of the standard. Like we, yeah. we learned that on. We're like, like yeah. I'll sit, don't worry, I'll send you this this conversation before <laughs> you, I release it. You don't it. have to. I, I, <laughs> I trust myself. No matter how many drinks I've had with Johnny, Ooh. I can handle it. But, wait, 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 uh, wait, did you just challenge something there? <laughs> no, 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 no. I do see some good scotch over there, though. We so, can get into that. Uh, no, no, uh, no. But seriously, I think I think that growing up, and and you know, we're similar age. You, I'd read the Guitar World magazines or, or all these interviews, and like you know, only had a couple pages, so that stuff's heavily edited. It's scrutinized. It's not. It's not real. And then you get right. the same bullshit questions over and over again. You don't really learn anything that you didn't already know. Yeah. Usually, and you'd never get a real inside look into someone's personality. Yeah. So when you're able to like, hey, it's just like what we're doing. Just have a conversation for. 35, 45, an hour, you really start to break the ice after a little, after when most interviews are over. That's yeah. when you start to break the ice and it's like, okay, this is when the actual cool information comes out, the stories, the, you know, everything else. And that's why I love podcast, the long form podcast um, format. And I think part of why, you know, my, sh my show has been successful because yeah. it's like, it's it's not bullshit, and people know they can't bullshit me because I do what they do. You do the same thing, you yeah. know that whole. I mean, that's and that's great because then then you, you have a lot of comfortability there too. Like I've noticed, like when sometimes I've I, uh, our show has opened up more to people outside of the music industry as well. So and that was something that was that's just you know, that's just selfish for me. I, I want to get to know these professional wrestlers and athletes and stuff right. as well. Yeah, because again. I already know this scene. We, are, we, we already know, we could sit here and talk about music forever, but I don't want to just talk about music. Like, yeah. that's, I'm, I'm, I'm over that. Like, that's, that's the boring stuff. No, it's, it's incredible sometimes on my show how much I don't talk about singing. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, like there are people, like, even some of the best singers that I really, like, I want to pick their brain. It's like, well, there's a lot more to life than just of your course. profession of, of screaming into a microphone or whatever so well hey. speaking of what are some of the other activities that you're excited about that you that you do like aside from the podcasting and singing that you're known for what are yep. some of the things that like on a daily basis what are what are what are you doing to, to stay busy dude i'll tell you man over the last couple years being home um getting way more into um diy like repairs and and stuff around the house and really? renovations and stuff yeah like like um my my father is super handy, um, you know. He's got every tool under the sun, and he's always you know tinkering with stuff. It's so been like that your whole life, I imagine. My dad has yeah, been, yeah. yeah. So I would learn stuff from him. Like I never considered myself super, you know, handy, but like having the last couple of years to be like, okay, well, you know, I can I can renovate a kitchen. I'll do it. I'll figure it out, and then just doing it and learning along the way. I've had so much fun, like with that kind of stuff. Like, I'll, sure, I'll tear down a wall, like I'll put in, I'll install like almost anything I feel comfortable doing now. And that's been something, I know it's not sexy. No, um, no, no. You know, it's mean, all maybe what I people want to hear. I think there's a lot of ladies but. picturing you with your shirt off, knocking down some walls <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my hammer, baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, would you like me to see it? <laughs> would you like me to use it on you? Yeah, yeah. Wait, no, that sounds Wait, that's, mm. Uh, Anyways, hammer uh, as in penis. Yes. I'm talking oh, about oh, the it's, hammer. It's more clear now. Not, it's I'm not trying clear. to hit anyone with a hammer. No, you don't want to kill them. No. Yeah. Well, maybe. Jeez, am I but, drunk? No, uh, not yet. <laughs> no. Uh, oh, so you mentioned a couple of the projects. I want to get into that though. Like, did you fully renovate your own kitchen? Is that what you're trying to tell me right now? Yeah. Well, well, I, so I had um, about 15 years ago, I bought a, a house as an investment to rent to some students. About a, a college town, about an hour outside of Toronto, okay. where I went to when I, where I went to university. The city's called Guelph, so it, was, it turned out to be a very, very good investment uh, with real estate now. Uh, and um, you know, it kind of came time. I live I live further away from it now. I was like, you know what, I'm going to sell this this property. But there's been students living in it for 15 years, pretty yeah. rough around the edges. Yeah. So I was like, you know what, I'll I'll do it. I'll do I'll, I'll do it all myself. So I did pretty much renovated the entire house myself and. Loved every second of it, honestly. You know, wow. just learning. Okay, I don't know how to do this particular thing. You know, whatever it is. Okay, I'll learn how to do it. And, and how would you learn how to do it? You, you know, a lot of YouTube, YouTube videos? University, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. There, there's a lot of that. Um, <laughs> my father actually had like a really, really old school like DIY manual. Oh shit! And it's really interesting, you know, how little house, you know, how houses are built. The like, technology has changed in the last like 
50 years. Yeah. You know, it's still like yeah. studs and drywall. As far as that And part, nails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah, a lot of that stuff is, is hasn't changed that much. So the basics, uh, you know, are, are the are the basics. So, yeah, I really enjoy it. Uh, I really enjoy that stuff. Um, Would you ever consider like, like down the road, there's a, there's a new project for, for Shane and he's renovating uh, fans' houses? For <laughs> a VIP, I'll, yeah. come, I'll come renovate your house. Um, <laughs> I I think that would be I don't know is there maybe like a home improvement like a like what if it's like a home HGTV improvement thing? Well, network like, and you show could do it, you could kind of maybe do it for charity or something I don't know hey, like you know I mean I'm not I'll come down it. for the demo I'll just have a few drinks okay, yeah. and I'll knock down some walls and you can rebuild it how about that <laughs> that sounds perfect <laughs> <laughs> well reno- I mean from renovating a little bit I I I didn't do this myself obviously but this was a single story house before and oh, in yeah. 2015. We did an overhaul, took it down to one wall, and just built up this this brand new house. Cool. And but before that, even with it was an older house that I always knew this was going to be the plan. So I would have me and a couple buddies, and we would do not an entire kitchen remodel, but we do like a lot of uh, DIY projects around the house. And I, I always thoroughly enjoyed it. Felt felt it to be pretty therapeutic. And yeah. then by the end, not even just the moment. A lot of people think of therapeutic like, oh, it's getting me locked in. It's like it's not even that. It's like when you're done, that feeling of accomplishment, right? For sure. Yeah, I, I, both that feeling and also, I don't know, man, like if I'm drywalling a room or something and like, sure, it might, maybe it's like seven or eight hours straight, I'm, I'm like working on this. I don't know, it's almost like a little bit of an escape for me. It's like mm-hmm. I'm focusing on something. I'm not, you know what I mean? It's like almost like a, a I don't know, it's like my problems go away in a, in a little bit, in, in a way, and I, I uh, always really enjoy enjoy it, man. Yeah. It's, an, it's a little bit of an escape. An escape, yeah. And then so we, we, let's transition over from the escape route a little bit and go more into like when you're looking to be inspired for, for songwriting and yeah. stuff. I mean, that's not, I'm sure that's not while you're drywalling. You're like, oh, here comes a riff. Let me go. Well, sometimes, right sometimes in my head, you know, I'll like. Do you, get, do you have a bunch of phone, uh, voice notes? Oh, on your yeah. Phone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Everybody does. And I know. And I, look, and I look through and they're mostly like, now it's like by location. So it'll have like oh, yeah. where I was, like my address. And if I think it's cool, I rename it Dope. That's it. <laughs> That's How many dopes dope. do you have on your phone right not, now? No, I wish there was more. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you have the idea and you're like, oh, this is so sick. And then the next day you're like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, okay, also like, it's also hard for, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong or if you, if you share this. When you're, you're singing a riff and we're, we're in a heavier band. So like I'm, I'm doing like a lot of gents and dent and stuff like yeah, that yeah. to get my point across. Yeah. But then the next day when I listen back, I'm like, or maybe it might even take me a few weeks to listen back to one of these things. I'm like, what was that riff supposed to be? <laughs> I know. Well, I start, I, mine are kind of embarrassing because I usually explain. Like, I'm like, okay, this is the tuning I'm in. Maybe that's not a bad idea, And this idea, is the, actually. like, maybe the fret, like, I'm on so I know kind of, like, where, what shape I'm playing. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, God, I don't even know what tuning I was in that day because I'll just, like, mess around, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I think... Um, uh, but to, to your question about, you know, inspiration and stuff, you know, we have a new album that's coming out May 6th, um, Misery Made Me. Right. It's a record that was really written in lockdown, you know. The whole thing? Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, we, we our album before came out March of 2020. That's right. You were guys so, were touring on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Worst, probably the worst time you could ever release a record in human history. Honestly. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like you had, you, had, you knew you had a crystal ball or anything. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Would have went back and bought I crypto mean, too if I, I had that crystal ball. Yeah. But that's another, that's I got, another got story. Got a few friends that, that uh, we, we could talk about that <laughs> off, off camera. But no, no, but um, I think, you know, it was, it was a lot of emotions changing. All right. of us had, right? There were times when it was like, Oh fuck! I can do nothing but like I'll just do a puzzle today. This is kind of sick. And yeah. then the next day you're like, God, I hate this. And then you know you you go from like fear, like I mean, well the tour got canceled. Like, am I going to be able to make ends meet for a while? Like financially, do I need to just start saying yes to every email I get, like every opportunity? Um, to to sadness, to to anger. And there was so much. I'd wake up and I'd be like, all right, I'm pick up a guitar today. Like, what am I, what am I feeling? Mm-hmm. And there's this one particular song. Uh, it's the heaviest song Silverstein's ever written. It's called Die Alone. 
and uh and that's I, the uh that's the single that's coming it's out coming tomorrow. out yeah it, exactly it's coming that's out very soon the, the, the people at home listening and watching right now have already had a chance to listen to it yeah by the time this comes out yeah and they'll i'm sure they'll agree this is this is heavy this is dark but you know i made a demo of it just tuned the guitar down super low cranked up the amp i had feet like i, I didn't even use a like a virtual plugin i used a real amp okay. and i was sitting right beside us i said this feedback and i was just you know like this old 800, um, uh, JCM 800 that I picked up. Okay. I've always wanted an 800, and I found the, I found a good deal on it. Great, like the the year I wanted, you know, um, which was the uh, uh, 82. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's the one with the I don't know. It's uh, it's the one, the lead it's series the one. Yeah. one Everyone one look channel. at the 82 uh, JMC uh, yeah. JCM uh, yeah, 800. Yeah, the, the one channel one, you know. Yeah. And um, so I just cranked it up, and it was just like okay. I'm fucking pissed off. You know, I just am. At, yeah. And at that day I was. I'm not not every day I was. No. That day I was. And I, I kind of came up with these riffs and I sat in the desk with this microphone and I just screamed. And it was like a very a very cathartic uh, emotional um, performance mm -hmm. that I wasn't I didn't never expect anyone to hear. It was almost just like getting this out. But when I listened back to it, I was like, damn man, this is like I don't think I've ever made mouth sounds like this before you right. know it was like different so then when it came time to actually record the song in the studio i was like damn like i i, I have to beat the demo because there's something about the demo from where i was mentally where i was sitting just the environment that day so it was like okay it was, it was something we had to sort of like recreate right and it was like oh some a lot of referencing like the demo like how did i do that like that scream, you know, yeah. in that spot. So it was, you have it to was watch cool. out for demoitis, though. Sometimes, you, right? You do. Oh, for sure. Demoitis is a is a totally yeah, real right. thing. But sometimes, though, you do listen sometimes, back no, to the yeah. demo and you're like, eh. we do. We do a lot of shootouts with some guitar yeah. tones that we get in, in some yeah. of the demo stuff too. Just the tones themselves. And you're mm -hmm. just like, you, you bring in all the equipment, all the all the different guitar heads and pedals and everything. And you're like, yeah, this digital one still sounds better for whatever I know, reason. I know. I know. And we could talk about this a little sidebar about the. First time I heard about Kemper amps, this oh. is probably back to 2013 or 14, we were making a record and I, we had this old GMP Marshall that we'd used on a bunch of stuff and it sounds great. So I was like, I don't want to see a Kemper. We're bringing any amp you want, I don't want to see a Kemper. I don't, I don't believe in it. Yeah. So we, we uh, AB'd the two amps, the, the GMP, just sick amp versus the Fake blind, one, blind, blind, the fake blind, one. Blind here, blind. Yeah, I heard him. I was like, I know that's the that's the real one. That's the fake one. And the producer said, no. I was fucking wrong. <laughs> and after that, I was like, I okay, I've been there. Everybody, yeah. every recording artist has been there. I think. <laughs> yeah. So now, now I'm like, why are we bringing amps to the studio? Let's yeah. just bring. But we did record a lot of you real need, amps. Need, on this there's record. a good. There's. I think there's a good happy medium between everything. Yeah. It, it is great that 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 the technology has come so far with uh with everything to emulate but there's something about the warmth of still having that that real stuff on on a record too there, there is and speaking of the song um there's a lot of feedback too yeah so you can't I had, record I had the privilege of, of of getting a, a sneak peek at the song already yeah I, I thought i mean i wouldn't describe it as your heaviest because you guys have a lot of heavy stuff mm -hmm. in my opinion of course you're the artist and you're the one who created it um, and maybe you're meaning in a different way, but I was really stoked to hear more of that punk rock sure. speed to it um, yeah. in the song. And I, I thought that that was like, that's something that I've heard in flashes over the 22 years totally. you guys have done. Totally. But like a full verse like that was something that I, I, I hadn't necessarily heard. Yeah, we have a couple, you know, like you brought Fat Mike and, and uh, I know you guys are friends with No Effects. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, love, I love the linoleum and all that. So, you know, um, for me growing up after, you know, I got through my Metallica metal phase and I found out about punk rock, No Effects is like, was my favorite band. Fuck yeah. So, you know, all the yeah. like double time fast drums, like that's all I wanted to listen to for a long time. It's yeah. like, oh, it's not fast? I don't want to listen to it. Oh, dude, I, and, I, I did the same thing. Yeah. For metal, I was, for, there was like one year when I hated metal, then I was like, nah, there's room for both. I like them both. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, now, I don't even know, if you ask me my favorite kind of music, I don't really have an answer. I no. like everything. But um, that, you know, double time fast drumming was something I think at the beginning of Silverstein we tried to stay away from just because I'd done it before. Yeah. It was like, this is a new project. 
but then like it's still an influence. Mm -hmm. So there's been a few times over over some over the years we've done that. Um, but you're right. This has been the first time we've done this like double time, you know, hardcore punk uh, inspired uh, rhythm in yeah a couple records, a few records at least. Right. So okay, it was yeah. fun. It's got obviously got a lot of got a lot of energy to it too. Um, but yeah, but the feedback had to be there, and you yeah. can't record feedback properly through like monitors like through ns10 yeah, you know yeah. um studio monitors so yeah got to get in the room it's got to be loud you got to get right up to the speaker and rec i recorded the feedback and then the next day i didn't like it so i recorded it again but yeah. like, oh, i did man. feedback twice you know well i so. will say that is a little bit of the lead singer syndrome is the perfectionist part of it too can get yeah. in the way not, not the ego part where you know we're talking about but like just which i think is is great is um i know for our, for us in the recording process shadows is gen generally the guy that, that hears these clicks when we're doing mixing and stuff. Mm. And for the longest time, I was like, how the hell is he hearing this? And then I started to clip, like, pick up on it, too. Mm. Just these weird, weird little uh, inconsistencies that we had to clean up, like in posts and stuff, because you did get the raw sound, and you want to leave it as much as you can, but sometimes right. you have those clicks that just bug certain people. Interesting. And yeah. uh, so, so I, I've become keen to it over the last 25 years, however fucking long I've been doing it. And yeah. Uh, 20 years, 40 years, so. Yeah, it's, nah, it's That'll wild, get cut out. it's wild, but no, obviously, yeah, I mean, yeah, Matt, Matt like, what, a, what an ear that guy has, what yeah, a talent, right, right, so, right. What, you know, what a, what a guy. Um, so, speaking on feedback, a different kind of feedback, has, uh, has the fans been able to hear any kind of teasers yet for the new album of any kind? Yeah, we've, we've released, um, this will be Dylons, I think the fourth single, okay. and uh, we're going to have another quick single right before the record drops, so. So you guys five are going, singles. You're doing five singles before the record even drops. Yeah, that's the kind of the new way, you know. Okay. Um, it's almost like it's almost weird how when the record comes out, it's almost like that's closer to the end of the record cycle than yeah. the beginning these days. But it's also cool to give people a little bit of a sneak peek. And what I really like about the all the five singles we chose is they're all a little bit different, but they don't give away the record. They're still we saved a lot of kind of cool little other parts of the of the uh, record for people to explore and that's the great thing about our band is that we have so much diversity within our music we can mm -hmm. do everything you know the last track is this finger picking in almost like an indie rock song acoustic and then we have um you know something like die alone which is super heavy and punk rock and then we have like the first track's almost like a festival euro we were calling it the euro festival rock anthem you know so it, it's is that um, the working title on the on the board it, it, it kind of was yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so no we um it's it's i think that that's part of why 22 years we've been keep, we've kept pretty much the same lineup and uh we're all excited about what we do it's because you can't get bored yeah we just have so much diversity in our music yeah that's great that's great to have too and and to the point of, you don't want to get fucking bored. As soon as you get bored, you're, you're not going to do it anymore. You're going to do it piss poorly. I mean, that's, that's true. That's, and that's unfortunately what happens to a lot of bands. I won't name names, but you know. Um, yeah, but yeah. like, it, it, yeah. it's, it's just kind of what happens. Everyone's, everyone who asks the question, what happened to that band? It's like, they probably got pretty complacent. I mean, it just seems like that's kind of what generally happens. Yeah, you know, I think there's a couple, a couple reasons. Um, and again, we won't name names, but I'm sure people listening, watching this, they will have a band in their head. Because yeah. it happens. It happens often. And I think what it is, is you get older, you get to be in your, you know, maybe your mid, late 30s, your 40s even, and there's a lot more responsibilities that come into play. Yeah. Even if you're not married, if you don't have kids, it's just, your days are more filled, filled up. Especially these days, there's, Back in the day, it was like, okay, you make a record, you go on tour. There isn't social media. There wasn't oh, like, man. it's the just, old days. there's just so much now to do. Mm -hmm. I really think that bands, instead of booking more studio time, they book less yeah. and they spend less time writing and less time practicing um, either just because they're busy or they just, maybe they think they don't need to or whatever it is, or maybe they don't enjoy it as much. And I think that that's the thing. And, and we're very conscious of that in Silverstein. We end up booking more time to record. Mm -hmm. We end up booking more time to, to rehearse and more time to go over stuff because it's our 10th album. I'm not saying we're out of ideas. There's always ideas, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes it's like, well, have we, have we sang, I've sang that melody before. Like I'm Googling my own lyrics sometimes yeah, being I like, say that? have I said this line? <laughs> have I used this, this idiom or whatever? And it's like it, making records, this is the truth. It doesn't get easier. 
No. And you need to put more time into it and you need to put more care into it. And I think a lot of bands just are not capable of that. It sounds like you guys have a similar process in that you do all the writing and demoing out before you go into record. Is that, is that generally your way? Or are you, are you working with a producer pretty hands-on um, early on in the writing phase? We always have, no, we always have the songs, at least the skeletons of the songs, mm -hmm. pretty much ready to go. This last record, and even the record before, we really had it dialed in. Like right. we, knew, we even knew what all, like all the vocals were going to be. Um, there were some lyrics we had to write. Like there weren't a lot of second verses written yet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we knew what the chorus was. We knew what the verse idea was. We might have had an idea of what the bridge was going to be. Structures can change. But like the riffs and the, you know, all that stuff was, was ready to go. Um, back in the day, I think we were a little bit less... Yeah, we had the music ready. It was a kind of like, okay, well, Shane's just going to do his thing on the vocals. And there was some stuff I wrote literally the night before. I, <laughs> I, I recorded it, and that's the truth. Do, but, you, do um, you look fondly back on those, on those moments? Um, sort of. I think yeah. it's weird. When you're writing, when you're writing um, lyrics, and you know it's like, okay, the next day I'm recording it, and it's going to be the real thing on the record. Yeah. There's a certain pressure that's like, okay, this has to be it right now. Whereas if I'm writing... A demo and I'm not we're not even recording it and we don't even know it's the final thing well then like I don't know does this line have to be perfect okay mm. I'll change it later and then and then you don't change it later because yeah. you get the, like the demo itis like you're talking about and it's like oh and then it's like okay is that a, a sort of element of complacency as you mentioned too mm -hmm. I don't know but I think um, going into the idea of writing of writing lyrics and everything I think it's like just you gotta if it takes you three hours to get four lines done of a verse, then it does. Right. If it takes you 10 minutes, it, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't, work, work time does not equal what, yeah. what ends up happening, right? You know, we've written, we've written some of our best songs in 15 minutes. We've written some of our best songs in five years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's, yeah, that's, no, the, that's the reality. Just, it, absolutely. I mean... It, it, it so much goes into it, obviously, and you know, we could talk about that a little bit more. But I, you look a little empty. Yeah, I look a little empty. very empty. I'm thinking, uh, would you like another beer? Would you like to uh, sample any of the scotches? What do you? What do you I thinking? would love a scotch. All right, let's let's I'm a let's, big uh, scotch let's take guy. a break and see what we what we got here. Let's go. Well, what do you what are you after? Well, let me see here. You take a look. We got I, some, some stuff that's blended. We got some stuff that's single malt. We got some. Some stuff that's uh, uh, quickly aged, like oh, this stuff well, from Lost Spirits. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, I, my Lafroy, I love. I love, yeah, I love smoky, peaty. Have you had the triple wood? Um, I have not. Well, let's do, let's try that. I love Lafroy. What? Well, you're a little taller than me. If you can grab the 10, I'll have the 10. I'll give you the triple. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Let me actually grab I'm, that. I won't, uh, I won't be too mad about that. Y'all, there's just a little bit left on the triple wood. What triple uh, woods is, uh... Johnny, I know you're, I mean, you're a drinker, obviously, and you yeah, probably yeah. like everything. Do you have a favorite spirit, if you had to pick one? You know, I really wish I did, but it's like, it's probably a scotch if I'm going, like, liquor. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's leave that there. Maybe he'll actually, my director will actually use that shot. But, uh, yeah, for me, it's... As far as liquor goes, yeah, I'd probably say a scotch or just whiskey in general if I was being yeah. more broad. Um, I really enjoy wine though and beer as well. Yeah. You know, like those are those are my things. I think they all kind of go hand in hand, to be honest. Oh, look at that! I killed the bottle. That's it, that's that's for you, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Let me get myself a little bit, and we'll go oh, that continue this. Good. If you've ever got four hours uh, to kill, you can go on YouTube. And watch, uh, I forget who it is, reading four hours of Lafroy whiskey reviews. Is that about uh, how terrible how terrible it is? Who is this? <laughs> I it's forget. Not Ron Swanson or what's the actor's oh, name? Is oh, it? is it? I, I forget. I haven't seen it in um, in quite a few years, but it's. Uh, I, did, I mean, obviously, didn't watch the whole four hours. Oh well, you didn't have four hours exists, of time to pull that. The fact that it exists is pretty amazing. <laughs> well, now that we got like the Scotch, we got Lafroy. Cheers, hey, man. Cheers. I'm glad. Cheers. I'm glad. I'm glad you're a Lafroy guy. Again, you have a show tonight, though. Uh, I'll be okay. It's we're supporting 45 minutes. I'll, I'll be all right. 
Well, I, I was going to get going to ask you a little bit more about that just because I don't know about for you, but I learned a long time ago. That's good. It's good the triple wood. It's good, really right? good. I love the triple wood. Wow, that's smooth. It's like Le, it's Lefroy. Don't need any water. I don't think either. Anything. That's no, really no. good. Wow. It's like the standard Lefroy with just a little bit more yeah. woody taste to it. And that's yeah, it's a little. It's a little less smoky. Yeah, a smooths, little bit less. It smooths it out. Yeah, like the, the, yeah. the barrel on it. But for me, I, I was just bringing up a point. I mean, now I, I, I've gone through it enough times where I could have a couple of drinks before I go on stage. But I, for a long time, I typically made that a rule. I would not touch anything before I got wow. on stage. Then two songs in, I'd start to have my first glass of wine. Okay. By the end of it, you're feeling pretty good. Sure. Um, but what I learned is that I would, my performance would suffer just a little bit. And then mm. sometimes it'd suffer a lot, obviously. Um, and I had to learn to get through that. You, using your vocal cords as your instrument. Yeah. I know that, you know, I, I know how that can be a struggle for a lot of singers. Uh, drinking on the road and stuff, dehydration is not good for vocal cords. Yeah. Um, how do you manage all that? Um, honestly, I think the more you stress about it, the worse it is. Yeah, really? I think so much of it is mental. Obviously, not always. There yeah. are people that wake up, I'm the fucking front man, you know, and, right. it's, and, it's, and it's bad. Um, but I think there is a, a lot of it, a lot of it is um, mental, and I think there are days when I wake up and my voice feels a little raspy, and I start to freak out, and I start to you're overthink a little, it. You're a and, anxious. Yeah, get anxious, and then that it it's like almost like doesn't allow you to just take your mind off it, and your voice just kind of wake up naturally. Because so many times I'll wake up in the morning and be like, I don't know if I can sing tonight, and then by the time it's like showtime or, or doors are opening. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. And then I get on stage and I'm like, I sang awesome. Like I sang better than usual. Right. And this morning I was stressed out about it. So I, I think I've learned to be like, oh, it's gonna be okay. Don't worry about it. You know, drink, drink, like don't do anything stupid today. You know, yeah. don't like eat a bunch of spicy food and drink a bunch of scotch at 2 p.m. Wow. Uh, but I, but I, I, my voice feels good today, so I'll be yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But fun. you know, but you know, um, but I think that that's a big thing. I think there's a, like a really, really big mental block that happens to a lot yeah. of singers um and some guys get freaked out by it and some guys are really perfectionists and they they say to themselves okay well if i can't be like a hundred percent or a hundred and ten percent then you know i don't know if i should should do this but i mean i always i sometimes have to remember that i am I am the best person at my job i'm the only person that does this job right to be this singer of silverstein I'm the best person at the world in the world that can do this right now, even right, if I'm so. at 75 percent. Right. So I need, you know what I mean. And and people are there and they're excited. And the truth is, people don't really notice yeah. if you're like not 100 percent, as long as you're not saying every song. <laughs> oh, I'm sick. I'm sorry. Like never, never, never do that. Never no, do that. never apologize unless it's really, really bad. Yeah, like, yeah real egregious. Like it's it's like got to be like it's a cat like getting murdered or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And to be to be fair, um, I had one of those on the last tour. Oh, did you? We yeah, we came back um, after the long hiatus. We shouldn't have done this, but we booked nine shows in ten days. Whoa, that's a lot of shows. It dude. was a lot. We started with five, day off, and then we had four. So not, you know, there was a day off in the middle, but still, it's a lot. We're playing two hours. Um, you were no breaks your, for me. The headliner sets, nine and ten in ten days. Yeah, two hours. So wow. um, we got through uh, Denver, and sometimes, like, the elevation the can elevation kind of fuck with you. real hard there, man. And, and the dryness, yep. very dry, and this is wintertime and stuff. So I, uh, I just was like, something was off. And I didn't really know if I was sick. Didn't want to test for COVID. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. But I don't I, have it. I'm just I not going to test for it. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I'm, I'm long it. story short, I did get <laughs> tested and I didn't have COVID. Perfect. I didn't want to test, but I did test. And I didn't have COVID. I don't know what it was. I think it was just a cold, honestly. Not being around people for two years, really. Yeah. I think my immune system probably, you know. That happened... To a lot of us in a lot. Like, yeah. now that everything's finally lifted, everyone's got all sorts of different stomach flus yeah. and colds and everything. No, it's like, no, dude. It's real. Dude, for sure. And, and yeah, and I, uh, we played in Portland, Oregon, and um, I just, about halfway through the show, my voice just went. It was just gone. Yeah. And yeah. We, we had to cut a few songs, and 
it wasn't pretty and I couldn't really talk after and we ended up having to cancel uh, our show in Seattle. It was the first show we'd ever canceled in 20, wow. 20 years. 21 years. Never canceled a show before. Oh, you're a rookie then. We've canceled a lot of shows. <laughs> I, I, know you, I know you've canceled a lot of shows. I've, I've actually had this conversation with Matt before about, yeah. about it. About his, his take is like, I need to be 100%. Yeah. This is, and I, I completely respect that. Um, but if I, if I had to be 100%, we would have canceled a lot of shows. Like, I don't know about <laughs> half of them, but like, I'm not always 100%. Yeah, the yeah. reality is on, on tour, it's very, very hard. There's of a course. lot of, the odds are stacked against you. Yeah. Well, there's also you know? the there's also the factor of you know um, just other factors come into play too. It's not not everything is going to get canceled just because one guy. You know, there's a lot of as you know, there's a lot of moving parts. I don't want to want to throw my brother under the bus here. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, it's um, definitely man. It's 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 tough. It's tough, and there's no. I've never been more depressed, maybe in my life. Then having to cancel that show, disappoint the people in Seattle, and then worry for two days, not speaking, resting my voice, for two days worried, is it ever gonna come back? Did I like did I do irreparable right. damage did, to my to my voice? That's a fear. See, and did you see a throat doctor? Do you have a vocal coach that you work with? Did it, no, I don't have a vocal coach. I've never been to a doctor before. Mm. Ever. Wow. Mostly don't want to know. <laughs> They'll look in there and go, you have yeah, to stop yeah, immediately. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't even talk. Yeah. Um, so, but I've ne- I haven't had too many knock on knock on wood. I haven't had too many vocal problems, um, but that was tough. But my voice came back. Um, awesome. I didn't. No, I didn't go see a specialist. I went to like a regular um, doctor that tricked me into taking a COVID test. Uh, I didn't have COVID. Tricked you into totally. It? And I'll, okay, I'll explain it really yeah, quick. Yeah, you need to explain that. So we went to a clinic in in Portland area, and it was this big facility. And the um, kind of regular practitioner said, okay, well, there's a specialist upstairs. And like, you know, you can maybe, they can give you some steroids that you maybe need or whatever. Um, or like the, the shot in the butt or whatever you're supposed right. to do. So I'm like, okay, well, yeah, would love to see that, that specialist. So then somehow they said, okay, well, the specialist will only see you if you take a COVID test. So I said, okay. All right, well, I guess I'll take one. Yeah. So I take the COVID test, it's negative. And then she starts prescribing me steroids. That's how she decided. She said, she just said this. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. What about the the specialist I'm supposed to see upstairs? And she goes, oh, he's not in today. No shit. I'm like, what the fuck? So yes, I, I literally got tricked into um, into getting. I mean, there's worse test. things to get tricked into. Like. It's true, <laughs> it's true. But there was a there's you know I I was pretty sure I didn't have COVID and it it was a responsible thing to do mm-hmm. anyway. But but then there's the fear that like okay now we have a whole other problem. Yeah, what if it uh, like did something, shut you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were canceling shows at that point anyway. But yeah, anyway, Man. that's that's what happened. Man, that's gnarly. So I think we already touched upon it a little bit, but. Was the inspiration for your podcast, was it that narrative we're talking about, to controlling that narrative early on? I mean, because you started again, as I said, seven years ago. Yep. That's, that's one of the earlier Amazing. music podcasts I can think of yeah. um, in the category. Yeah. Um, was, yeah, I'm over was three. It really just, was it just to control your own narrative, or was it just kind of a fun thing? You're like, hey, I'm just going to have some of my buddies on here to talk about some shit. A little of both, okay. I think. Um, yeah, no, over 300 episodes is pretty crazy. You had over three hundred now. I have over three hundred now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I've missed a, missed a week here and there. Right. Um, wow. But three hundred, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's it's been such a great ride. I met so many friends through it, and I look forward to every single conversation I have. Um, you can probably tell I like to talk. Yeah. So, um, but no, man. What well, how it all came came to be was I did this um, feature for a magazine where I interviewed. Um, buddy from Census Fail, and he interviewed me. Right. So we wrote questions for each other, and we sent them. And I don't re- exactly remember what I asked, but but I always, you know, I wanted to make it good because mm-hmm. I because I know and, and and he hit me back after and was like, hey man, that was really like that was really cool. Like you really came up with some great questions. So that got kind of got the wheels turning. When it's like, okay, well, I've done so many sorry bad interviews with people. <laughs> I don't need to apologize for that. Not the my same. Show. I hate doing all of your interviews. By the way, I'm telling you. Some that of them right are. Now. I'm sorry. Some of them are so like like. They know who they are. 22 years. Uh, you know, we don't, they don't need to go over they, the way the band name came from. Either. Uh, he, oh, dude. You know seriously. what I mean? We don't need to know that. Still getting those, and not only that. Like on top of it, like 
I understand, you could see it in the poor kid's face or the poor journalist's face, whoever it is, that they are just doing the editor's bidding and you're just like, you don't want to be here either, do you? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, you're excited to be here and talk to somebody, but you're also like, these are the questions I have to well, ask. Well, I that remember sucks, this one, man. probably the worst one I ever did, um, it was a Warped Tour, Warped Tour one. Okay. They don't screen too well uh, with who they let in to interview bands. And I sat down with this girl who's probably in high school. Right on. And she said, started asking me questions. Started talking to me. So I started answering and I realized, okay, she's not recording. She's not writing it down. She wasn't even writing it down. And I said, so what's going on? She said, oh, I'll just remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. So, I, say, I say right on. I saw my producer like perk up like, hey, you can't say that about a high school girl. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Just to clear the air, I meant right on. I've, I've had an experience with a high school boy like that. Uh, but yeah, it was a warp tour, <laughs> so I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. And anyway, but the, yeah, so uh, doing all those bad interviews, I was like, look, I know I can do a really good job at this. I know I, I know what to ask, because I know what, like, I always, I do, I'm like, why the fuck didn't they ask me this question? Right. Like, this is, you know, it's not that hard. So I really was like, okay, this, this can be something compelling. And originally, I wanted to do um, it as a, like a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, and I thought Lead Singer Syndrome was just a hilarious name. Uh, and that was what it was going to be. And then after a while, I started thinking about it like, I don't know anything about cameras. I, I know about editing music and editing audio because I'm yeah. a musician. I don't know how to edit video, really. And then somebody was like, what about a podcast format? I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And then, then I could do it remotely, you right. know. And everything else, so that's kind of how it started. And um, from there, it was just like, okay, I'm I'm doing this, I'm launching this, and I haven't stopped in no, seven awesome. years. And it's a great podcast. That's why I wanted to ask about the preface, uh, uh, the precipice of it, because mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was uh, it, like you said, a YouTube thing originally, and then and this was three years ago now. Yeah, and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about cameras. I pretended that I did. It was a little fake it until you make it kind of thing. Sure. And we had a great guy who was doing all the camera work pre-COVID. And then he moved to Pittsburgh on me, but he still works for us. So I, I had to quickly learn how to record the, uh, the video, obviously, as you saw. Yeah. And then I just ship it off to him for editing. Yeah, man. And to all you kids watching, fake it till you make it. It's a real thing. Oh, fuck yeah. Just set Set and book it. Book it <laughs> now and you'll figure it out. You know, crunch time sometimes. And if, and if you're, you're not 100, when you get there, you learn from it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, I, I see it all the time. People are like, oh, well, I need to. Do. It's like, no, you don't need to perfect everything and then book it. Book it and that'll give you some inspiration to, to make it happen, you know, whatever it is. And I think part of the fake it till you make it part that a lot of people don't talk about i guess or maybe i just don't hear enough people talk about it is the the, the real part that you need to learn from it is to be fearless the fake until you make a thing you might fail at whatever you're trying to do but to your point you'll also learn from it yeah and then you'll and then start a new project call it the the lead drummer syndrome you know? right sure <laughs> sure whatever <laughs> drinks with shane <laughs> drinks with shane he's feeling it <laughs> wow um but yeah, I, I think we covered most everything. But like, one thing I gotta ask everybody now, because like it's, it's gonna be a couple weeks removed. Did you think that Will Smith slap was real? At first, I didn't, but I think I do now. Really? Yeah. Like, it just seems like the way that the messaging has been since from both the Academy and the other actors talking about it and Will Smith's statement. And Chris Rock's statement, it, it does kind of all add up to me. Mm. And I, I do love a good conspiracy are, are, theory. Are you a professional wrestling fan? No, not overly. Okay. I mean, I love Jake the Snake, uh, Macho Man Randy Savage. Shout out to Jake the Snake, he's uh, been on the show. Really? Yeah, Holy crap. Uh, Million Dollar Man and Virgil. Another guy's been I, on the show. Yeah, so I, I'm, old, <laughs> I'm old school. Like once, um, once like Stone Cold and like that kind of era came into mm. play, I'm, I'm like pre all that. Okay. Um, I remember the uh, Royal Rumble. I got my parents to buy the pay-per-view right. when it was, I forget the, the, who it was, maybe Lex Luger. They went out of the ring at the same time. Okay. And I don't know, wait, this is like early 90s. And um, uh, I believe that was, that, wasn't that, 
Early 90s, that would have been Macho Man or Ultimate Warrior or Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. Because then they had to have a match after that to determine who got maybe. the title fight. I remember it was, I think, Lex Luger and maybe maybe, maybe Brett, maybe uh, Bret Hart, honestly. But mm. I, I can't. I can't recall, but I'm I'm old school wrestling okay. wrestling fan like that. So I ask not for the conspiracy theory part, but because I'm a bit I'm I've regained my love for professional wrestling since uh-huh. I started this podcast with guys like Jake the Snake and Sick. some other guys. Yeah, and uh, I, it just it seems like an obvious play to me. Like it's just yeah. like well, I mean, I mean the slap itself is real, but the storyline, everything around it, like. Who gave a fuck about the Oscars before that happened? True, but why would Will Smith put his neck on the line? Because he's not really putting his neck on the line. He's Will Smith. They picked who can put his neck on the line like that and come back. It was instantaneous, the people coming to his defense, when it's clearly, clearly he's in the wrong. Like that Clearly, is of, so, course, of course he's in the but wrong. But there's already people coming to his defense five minutes into his I feel like it. if it was scripted, it would have been a better script, though, too. Like the, the no, because that's the point of like with professional wrestling, the rawness. If you right. if you overscript it, it's not believable. Right. You got to leave it just like a little bit of people going like, did that really just happen? Like, is this? I don't know. It just seems. Will we ever know? No, because now the now the academy's got a hold of it, and now now the story is: is he going to be allowed back? It's just it's opened up too many cans. It's mm-hmm. opened up too many loopholes to me for it to not have been somewhat fixed. Had it been somewhat fixed. Maybe. I'm going out there. I'm saying it's fucking fixed. I don't give a fuck. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm on the fence. At first, I, I was on your side. But over like the, kind of the aftermath of it now, yeah. now I'm starting to, starting to think it might be, be real. Well, all I know, I know is I'm going to go uh, probably see Chris Rock when he comes through town now. So. Oh, his ticket sales are through the fucking roof. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Rightfully so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next time you come on the show, we'll have, to, we'll have to fix a slap between the two of us. We'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Can I do the slapping? <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll decide that later. <laughs> well, man, I think I've taken enough of your time today. Dude. Love to have you back Cheers. on. We can get into so much more, but I think you got to go to a show and got shit to do. We can get into so much more yeah. back there is yeah. what I'm saying. Hey, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Johnny. This Thanks is, again, man. It's an honor to be here. Thanks, man. And everyone go check out more from Silverstein. We got a new album dropping, as you said, May... Misery s- Made Me, May 6th. May 6th. We got a, a single. The fifth single is dropping tomorrow. Uh, fourth, fourth single. Fourth tomorrow. Fifth, fifth will come in. Lots of singles. We're, we're a very busy band. So, yeah, SilversteinMusic.com. You'll, we're always doing something. Fantastic. And uh, hope to hear some more from... Uh, Lead Singer Syndrome as well. Absolutely. I got some great episodes coming out. So yeah, awesome, leadsingersyndrome.com. Check it out. Awesome, man. Again, cheers. Till next time, everybody. Cheers.